Well, a delight to be with you uh, again. If I may have the uh, title slide of the sermon up, that would be helpful. There we go. I don't know who chose this passage for Mother's Sunday. Uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I'm sure there is nothing uh, particularly personal, particularly as Maria was here this morning, in, in the choice of the text. But we often say to one another, don't we? It's only natural if somebody is responding in anger to a bad situation, or if uh, somebody is speaking curtly, or even worse. It's only natural. What do you expect them to do? Uh, that's life. They've got to defend themselves. Uh, they have rights, and they need to justify them. But the teaching of Jesus comes as quite a shock, and I'm here simply to try and teach you what Jesus was saying to his disciples today and how his disciples live. It may be only natural to our sinful nature, but Jesus calls us to a very different way of life. No, it's not natural in terms of how God made us to respond in some of the negative, destructive, self-centered ways of life that we do. We have before us this morning two more of these sayings of Jesus. Uh, the, for the fifth and the sixth time, we are hearing those words that he spoke. You have heard, but I say to you. Here is a different way of living altogether. And John Stott rightly commenting, John was one of the great leaders of the evangelical church in the 20th century, a uh, superb Bible teacher. And in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he makes the point that nowhere is the challenge of the Sermon on the Mount greater than here. Nowhere is it more distinctive in terms of its call to Christian lifestyle. And nowhere is it more admired and nowhere is it more resisted and ignored. So we've got a tough challenge before us this morning. Hold on and listen coolly to what your master, if you're a Christian, wanted to teach us as his disciples. The fifth saying is a call to mercy and not retribution. Verses 43 to 48, if you've got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we, some weeks ago, were looking at an earlier saying of Jesus where he <clears throat> said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And here he is taking up that theme of mercy again mm -hmm. and expounding it in more detail. He talks, as he does in this section throughout, about the old law, the old law which we sometimes call the, the lex talionis, the law of justice, the law of retribution, the law of balance, that you'll find in many ancient documents in one form or another, but occurs in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 21, verse 21, in Exodus, uh, where you have that great list of the Ten Commandments, same chapter, it talks about this law in Leviticus 24. So it came at people in all sorts of ways. The Jewish way of looking at this law was somewhat different than the wider references to us, uh, to it in the ancient world. They would often say, well, you know, if it's a noble person who's offended you, your retaliation needs to be less. If it's a slave who's offended you, well, they don't count as much. You can treat them how you like. But here is enshrined this notion that God does want justice in his world. And we want justice in our world. There's an instinctive element within us that drives us to seek for justice, and rightly so. But let's listen carefully to what that law originally meant in its original context, those texts that I've spoken of. First of all, it was about the judicial or community process of seeking justice. It wasn't saying you as an individual 
can go and, if somebody's hurt you, go and strike them back equivalently. It was saying this is how the courts are to operate uh, in a judicial system. Um, and often in practice, what was uh, given as the law was commuted to a fine. Uh, and then we think, oh, this looks very bloodthirsty. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But actually, it's acting as a restraint, not as a liberty to do what you like. You know from your news programs, day after day at the moment, how people in the Middle East are very passionate about defending their honour and seeking justice. And often the response to an injustice is totally disproportionate. Uh, Israel and Gaza, by common consent, perhaps the response of Israel in Gaza at the moment is out of proportion to the injustices it suffered. You may disagree with that. But you get the point that you harm one person will blow up your house. And this law says, no, no, there is a proportion to be seen and demonstrated in, uh, in the judicial system. It's aimed at restoring relationships, not at exacerbating them further. But Jesus' teaching here is to his disciples, personally, individually. It's not addressed to the judicial system. We have to come at those questions from other parts of scripture. So Jesus is not commenting on whether the state has the right to operate this law. He doesn't say forget this law, but he does say, if you're a disciple of mine, on a personal level, there's an entirely new way of living. And listen carefully again to what Jesus was saying, because people so often get it wrong. As citizens of the kingdom, we are called not to respond naturally in our fallen world, but to demonstrate something of God's character and to live, yes, by the power of the Spirit, unnaturally in the world. Jesus does not say, when he says, but I tell you, he doesn't say, uh, resist evil. There's a place for doing that, and there's a place for the state to do it. What he does say is resist the evil person. Uh, it's when people do us wrong that he's concerned about. <laughs> and he's calling us not to accept injustice and then seek revenge and retribution and demand our rights. It's not about standing up for right. Uh, that's another issue. But it's about standing up for self that Jesus is talking about. And he illustrates it from their very ordinary day-to-day -day world four ways. You have to understand that he's talking in a context where they were driven by values of honour and of shame. They felt very deeply the slightest offence and the need to respond to it. And Jesus illustrates taking up four different ordinary experiences. What happens if somebody insults you? <coughs> slaps you on the cheek? Well, in his memorable words, you turn the other cheek. You don't slap them back. You don't demand your right. And this wasn't theory for Jesus. What happened when he was standing and being tried before the high priest? He was slapped on the cheek. Uh, he takes next a situation of injustice. Uh, say someone wants to take your shirt. They, they drag you into court to demand it if you're not willing to give it. And that was a fundamental breach of human rights as far as the Jewish people were concerned. Again, the Old Testament law 
said you have no right to take somebody's clothing overnight so that they're left in the cold. You have a duty to care for them and make sure that they're well clothed. And yet here's a situation where somebody's demanding a breaking of that law from Exodus 22 this time. And what does Jesus say? <laughs> well, don't only give them your shirt, give them your outer coat as well. Respond to them in an extraordinary way. The third illustration belongs to their world, not ours. It's about an imposition. The Persian postal system, which actually may have been more efficient than our postal system, come to think of it, uh, demanded that, uh, gave them the, the state the right uh, to demand any person uh, walk a, a, a thousand paces in delivering letters. And the Romans took that up uh, and took that as a law throughout the Roman Empire that Roman soldiers and officials had the right to demand anyone to take kit or uh, do their bidding for up to 1,000 paces, which translates into a mile. And you think, well, hang on a moment, that's not terribly convenient. I'm going to see my mate in Costa Coffee and I've got other things to, to do. Uh, what, how do you respond to this? What right have they to demand this? Well, Jesus says, if they ask you to go a thousand paces, willingly offer to go another thousand so that you don't demand your rights, but give yourself. And then the fourth I I I illustration, uh, closer to home maybe, somebody wants to borrow money, request money. The details are unclear. We've no idea what the situation is, why they want that money what relationship they have with you. But the spirit of the command is clear. We're not to be miserly, but generous. We're not to be moaning and grumbling, but open-hearted and open-handed. Those are challenging things, aren't they? Because everything within us rises up, the hackles get going, and we want to demand our right. Next time somebody beats you to a parking space, you've got your eye on. <laughs> Test your attitude to whether you're demanding your rights or not. It's natural, but it's not natural for a disciple of Jesus, born again by the Spirit of God. We're called to live differently. And that's the key truth that he wants to get upon, uh, uh, wants us to understand that self-sacrifice replaces self-centeredness if we are children of our Father in heaven. Oh, there are plenty of questions about it. this teaching. Doesn't straight off the page answer everything. There are big questions we all face. Uh, I remember speaking in a church in city center Belfast a few years ago a uh, fairly prosperous church, midweek meeting, hundreds of people there, uh, and uh, uh, several Tuesday evenings on a row, uh, in, in a row. And as we came out of the church, so there were a number of the rough sleepers on the steps asking for money. What were you to do? What was the congregation to do? They're tough questions. Were we going to help them? Were we wise just to give them money? Would they just go and spend it on more whiskey or what? <laughs> so it doesn't answer every question. We're still you encouraged to uh, use our minds. But actually, whatever the qualifications and whatever the difficulties, we need to hear the heart of Jesus and live by the heart of Jesus. Jesus spoke uh, about the way in which the blind guides of Israel we're very good at straining out gnats and swallowing camels. Oh, they were latched onto the little details. And the main principles died by a thousand qualifications. But here Jesus is saying, never mind the details at this point. Get the key truth right. As disciples of Jesus, we're not living for self-protection. 
for self-interest, uh, we're non-resisting, non-retaliating, and generous because we've received the generosity of God ourselves. Well, that's the eye for the eye. But then, as if that's not enough, he moves on to another saying, which is you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And here he calls us to love and not hate. Well-known words, widely rejected in practice. Again, let's look at the old law for a moment. That old law is partly based on Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which tells Israel to love their neighbor. Nowhere in the old law did you actually find that addition, so hate your enemy. Never said that. But when the law got around a bit like Chinese whispers, you know, you start here and it passes around <laughs> and you end up saying something slightly different. Oh, it's a logical thing. If we're to love our neighbors, then logically we're supposed to hate our enemies. But Charles Spurgeon, preaching on this, said that that was a parasitic growth on the Old Testament command. It didn't belong there. It was never there in the first place. Uh, Jesus doesn't go into demolishing it uh, in words, but undermines it completely by his new teaching. The enemies that he may have had in mind when he first spoke to his disciples were those who were going to persecute his followers. The leaders of Rome and Israel who were going to imprison them and torture them and even kill some of them. That phrase is used uh, in the uh, sect that was around at the time of Jesus called the Essenes down by the Dead Sea to speak about Gentiles as the enemy. And our world is constantly divided, isn't it, between insiders and outsiders, between neighbours and friends. The definition may be constantly changing, but it's always there. I was attending a seminar on homelessness on Thursday, listening to the wonderful story of a black charismatic church in uh, Tottenham in London that fell, as it were, by accident, except under the providence of God, into a ministry of housing the homeless. And as uh, the pastor was being asked about the various challenges he faced. The whole question of uh, housing those from different nationalities came up. And I wouldn't have thought of it. But he said the biggest challenge at one stage was the tension that erupted sometimes into fighting between the rough sleepers who were Poles from Poland and Russians because the Russians had taken their territory. Longer back it would have been Catholics or Protestants in Northern Ireland. Today it might be Jew and Palestinian. The world is constantly being divided between people like us that we feel comfortable with and others. And we feel justified and safe in sticking with those who are neighbors. But Jesus rides roughshod over that popular interpretation of the command which is never there in scripture love your enemies he says not just your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you uh, that's the headline given to this whole section in Luke's version of this parable that calls for us to engage in inclusive love Love especially towards those who are different, those who make life awkward for us. It's not limited to them. If we want to start defining, well, Jesus says we must love them, but we're not sure about somebody else, we're falling back into the old way. The new way of Jesus is that we have an open-hearted, generous spirit towards all. This is one of the most distinctive traits of the Christian life. 
<coughs> it's a, a forgiving love. When people do you wrong, you don't hold them to account on a personal level. There are many, many examples throughout Scripture. Jesus himself, as he stands before uh, the tribunals, suffering his passion. And on the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first Christian martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, as he is being stoned to death, responds, Do not hold this against them, Lord. There is that freedom, there is that forgiveness. Some of you may remember the story of the irrepressible Corrie Ten Boom. It was my privilege to be at a conference with her one year to see her in action. She was larger than life. For those who don't know, a Dutch uh, Christian family who harboured Jews during the war, who were then exposed by neighbours and taken off to Ravensbrück uh, uh, concentration camp. Uh, Corrie's parents didn't survive, and her sister didn't survive. But she did, and has been a wonderful example and champion of these very words from Jesus since. But it didn't come easy. She tells in uh, one of her books about the time when she was preaching in a church in Munich, and the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrook and was one of our actual jailers that she'd not seen since that time, came to see her at the end of the service. Suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy, her sister's pain blanched face, the shame of standing naked before those men. He came up, she says, as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said. To think that, as you say, God has washed away all our sins. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had preached to people so often about the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I pray, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand, but I couldn't. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I can't forgive him. Give him your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it's not on our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on God's forgiveness. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us along with the command, the love itself. Now that's the raw reality of the teaching of Jesus. Forgiving love, responsive love. Jesus says you do this so that you might be seen as children of your Father in heaven. Like Father, like Son, we often say. The Father doesn't operate <coughs> according to those it's only natural type of responses. But extraordinarily generously showers his grace, his common grace, on all sorts. <laughs> it's amazing how we mangle scripture, isn't it, to our own ends. I remember not, well, it must have been last year sometime, it can't have been this year, going across early one morning to pick up my paper, 
The sun was shining, that's why I can't have been this year. <laughs> and somebody I normally say good morning to as we pass in the road said, yeah, the sun shines on the righteous. Is that what Jesus said? Absolutely not. First of all, he spoke about sunshine and rain, so that applies to this year. <laughs> and he said that in the extraordinary grace of God, it shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is so merciful in his generosity towards his creation. And we are called to that family likeness. So it's a responsive love to the grace that we ourselves have received. But an extraordinary love. A love that outclasses people's normal calculating approach. If I love, what will I get back in return? Uh, Jesus had warned earlier, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and now he says, listen, if you only love those that you're going to get back from, well, doesn't everybody do that? But we are called to be a distinctive people, marked out by our generosity and not by our self-centeredness. Hey, this is tough stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the call of Jesus on his disciples. And as if that's not enough, he then comes to... Uh, a, a frightening verse that tends to sum up all that he's been saying up to this point. Uh, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Don't know about you, but I find that terrifying. <laughs> it's a variation on the book of Leviticus again, chapter 19 and verse 2. It says, be holy because I am holy. But when we unpack the word, maybe perfect isn't the most helpful translation in English because it implies sinless perfection. We never make a mistake. Whereas when it's used as it is frequently in the Old Testament, for example, it, it, it's about uh, used to Noah and, and Job and Abraham. And what it's calling for is not sinless perfection because uh, Job and Abraham if not Noah, we're certainly not perfect in that sense. But what it's calling for is a wholehearted commitment. A wholehearted commitment. This sermon recognizes that we're still a work in progress. It said that earlier. Hunger and thirst for righteousness is recognized the, the need to, to grow in things. We're not there yet. But what God looks for is a heart. That however much it struggles in practice, actually is centered on him and focused on doing his will and living not a natural life, but an extraordinarily different life because we're disciples of Jesus. <laughs> so being a Christian isn't about living an ordinary life and coming to church on Sunday as others might go to the golf course or indulge in a long country walk. It's just our leisure activity. Uh, being a disciple of Jesus, if we've made him Lord, is a call to an altogether different kind of life. Be perfect. Be wholehearted. Because that's what God looks <coughs> for in you. Because that is what God has done in giving us his son. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Amen.